Good morning. And welcome to Trinity. On this, the 18th Sunday after Pentecost, we welcome those that will join us a little later on our recorded service. God has called us through the gospel so that we may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our opening hymn is 439, Blessed are the pure in heart.
first lesson is written in the book of Proverbs, chapter 31, verses 10 to 31. A capable wife who can find, she is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from far away. She rises while it is still night and provides food for her household and tasks for her servant girls. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff, and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid for her household when it snows, for all her household are clothed in crimson. She makes herself coverings. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the city gates, taking his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She supplies the merchant with sashes. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household, and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her happy. Her husband too, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her a share in the fruit of her hands, and let her works praise her in the city gates. The word of the Lord. Our selected song this morning is Psalm number one, found on page 705 in your prayer book. We'll say it together, all the verses together. Happy are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor lingered in the way of sinners, nor sat in the seats of the scorners. Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and they meditate on his law day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, bearing fruit in due season, with leaves that do not wither, and everything that they do shall prosper. It is not so with the wicked. They are like shaft, which the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked shall not stand upright when the judgment comes, nor the sinner in the counsel of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked is doomed. Giver of life, save us from the desert of faithfulness, and nourish us with the living water of your word, that we may bring forth fruit that will last. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The epistle is written in the book of James, chapter 3, starting with verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambitions in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder and you covet something, and cannot obtain it. So you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. 
you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our graduate hymn is 649. We'll sing verses 1 and 2 before the gospel. disciples say unto them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into the human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying, and were afraid to ask him. <coughs> then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent. For on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them. And taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. The Gospel of Christ. Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. For our sake, he was crucified upon the child. 
He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, and glory to rest of the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, with the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of the sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. of all our hearts be totally acceptable to you, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, I know I'm going to disappoint most of you. I'm not going to be talking about the merits of a capable wife. Because when I look out here, I'm terribly outnumbered. And I'm sure I would slip on a banana peel somewhere during that conversation, so we're not going there. <laughs> Linda read all of that, and it's scripturally based, and we'll take it from there. <laughs> what we're going to talk about is the teaching that Jesus had embedded in that short few verses, to be more like a child in order to be the greater you. It's centered around an argument between friends, between companions that were tightly knitted together, Jesus' disciples, as they're walking along the dusty road to Capernaum. And unbeknownst to them, Jesus, of course, all-knowing, knew that they were arguing. He also, I expect, knew what they're arguing about, because that's where he takes the message on a little bit later. He calls them out, to which they were silent. When I was reading that again, I said, I wonder how many of us have ever got into a conversation with somebody and got overheard by somebody, and then that somebody says uh, something in reference to what you were saying, which you thought you were saying in secret, and we were probably mostly silent on our outcome of that as well. He knows what, Jesus knows what was going on. One of the most common traits that I continue to discover as I read scripture is how Jesus confronted authorities and others in his three and a half short years of ministry. He very often would answer a question with a question. Turn the table around. What he's doing here this morning is he's turning the values that we hold upside down. When he says, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. And if that doesn't upset your value system, he goes on to say, put a child among them, and taking it in his arms, he said, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Well, we should be wrestling with that a little bit in our own minds as we go through life, because we have this such accurate, mature set of values and norms that we run to. And he's telling us we need to be a little bit more childlike. We need to think a little bit more like a child. We need to respect the child, maybe more so than the values that we have set in front of us. The norms in life. Well, when you think about it for a minute, you've got the 12 assembled here, and they're walking on this dusty road. And they're saying, well, surely I must be the greatest. 
Simon and Andrew. They might have been the first to say that because they were the first chosen. And we all know seniority matters, right? Peter might have chimed in because he's the only one that identified Jesus as the Messiah. But what about Peter, James, and John? They're the three that Jesus chose to take up the mount for the transfiguration experience. Peter might have added to that, it's me. Because I had enough faith to step out of the boat. Which I think the other 11 would quickly say, yeah, you sank like a rock. <laughs> and then possibly the 11 ganged up on Judas, knowing that Judas always had his hand in the till. John might have trumped it all by saying, you know, the greatest would be the one that was closest to the honored one. And we read in scripture where John laid on Jesus' breast. See, it's easy for each one of them to say, I'm the greatest. They can make a case for themselves in isolation of everything else that happened around them. A single moment in time, they would say, I'm the greatest. And why is that easy for us to come to the same conclusion? Because we often would do the same thing. I did a good deed this afternoon, so that erased the week that maybe I didn't do something as honorable. In the present system, do we strive to be the greatest human being, or do we strive to bring out the best in humanity? I think that's where Jesus is coming from. Whoever wants to be first must be last and servant of all. In other words, not lifting ourselves up, but lifting others up around us. Well, we're taught to be first. That's human nature. We're taught to be the leader of the path. In sports, our careers, we're always striving. Certainly the grade school education, we know that an A or an A plus is better than a B. And when I was thinking about that little bit, I should have paid a lot more attention to Venerable Harry Quinn over the years, because I didn't realize he was giving me some defense for my poor grades in this piece of scripture. Wouldn't it have been an interesting argument to come up to my parents with my extremely poor report card and say, well, it's scriptural. The last will be first. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the moment would have been short-lived. <laughs> Probably with uh, some detention in my bedroom. But then they would have got a chuckle out of the fact that I actually knew a piece of scripture back in those days. What's at play here, though, is Jesus is calling us out. Not to focus on our own accomplishments, not to puff our chest out, but what have we offered of the gifts that he gave us for others around us? And I think that's a conversation people will ask sometimes about, particularly when they're nearing the end of life and whatnot, they want to talk a little bit about, what do you think? Well, I don't know. I haven't been there. When I get there, I will know, but I won't be able to tell you. Right? We have that scripture in there, too. Don't tell my brothers so they don't act like they're acting, so they won't end up where I end up. But the reality is, I personally think the conversation that I will have will not be anything about what I have done, it'll be more about what didn't you do with the gifts I gave you to share. Well, let's take it a little bit differently. Who in your life would you refer to as the best person you ever met? Not the greatest, but the best. Why would you pick that person? What qualities or characteristics stand out in that person over others? It's probably not their wealth or their influence or social structure. It's probably more that that's the person that would have your back when times are tough. You see integrity, you see trust. They inspire you to have hope, strength, and faith when you needed it most.
So why does Jesus take it a step further and bring in the child? Well, this past 10 days, as most of you know, Heather and I were in an intensive course of trying to be grandparents. And the reality is, life kind of stops around, especially in the situation we were in, because the parents took off to Spain and left us with the four-year-old and the one-year-old and a dog. The dog gets honorable mention. But the reality is, other things get less important because you start seeing the world through the eyes of a child. The child who has no mature values, if you will. Now, I grant you, the four year old started to negotiate. But you get the purest of comments. Every action that you do, you get a reaction. Some are good, some are not so good. But you get immediate response. I, in my planning, a little bit I packed was like, I packed three books to read. I said, I'm gonna catch up on some reading and I'll have some downtime over there. I can tell you, I brought the three books back. I think the cover's open. <laughs> Living life through the needs of a child. I was thinking as I opened up one of my emails Saturday morning and it was the minutes from the inner city youth ministry meeting that I missed while I was in London. And I got thinking, you know, Trinity Church was the first parish to step up for inner city youth ministry. I'm not sure if you all realize that. And if you Google or go on Facebook and look at city, inner city youth ministries, you'll read the following. A registered charitable organization that supports children, youth, and families through relationship building and encourages social, physical, emotional, and spiritual growth. It started back in 1989, and it was a project of the Diocese of Fredericton and Trinity Anglican Church Parish. Now think for a moment, that was 35 years ago. So a child that was five years old that, that, in that time, that year, would be 40 now and have children of their own. And can you imagine the influence inner city youth ministry made to the next generation coming forward and makes continually today as we keep carrying on the mission statement of that organization. See, what Jesus gave us when he started talking about the child reference in the, in the scripture is he gave us a living parable. It doesn't stop. Whoever welcomes, whoever embraces the child embraces me. It is showing the hospitality that Jesus wants us to show others. So as we go, go away from here this morning, take a moment and think about the ways in which you love and serve others in your circle of influence and outreach. Are you prepared to share your story if your time was now to speak to your Lord and Savior over the gifts that he gave you to share with others? Amen. Prayers of the people, we're going to go to page 117 in your prayer book. Prayers for morning. Let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. Let us ask the Lord for a day of fulfillment and peace. Lord, have mercy. Let us ask the Lord to teach us to love others as he has loved us. Lord, have mercy. Let us ask the Lord for peace and justice in the world. Lord, have mercy. Let us ask the Lord to strengthen and relieve those who are in need. Lord, have mercy. And at this time, we would offer our prayers and our thanksgivings to the life of Claire Cleary. 
Claire is still with us, but she's nearing her time to go and graduate from this physical world to be with her Lord and Savior. Dear Lord, we thank you for her life. We thank you for her family, her outreach that she has done, the ministry she has done in her life as a nurse and as a teaching nurse. And we ask that you cradle her in your arms and carry her safely to your presence. Lord, have mercy. Let us ask the Lord to renew the church through the power of your living spirit. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy, and he welcomes sinners and invites them to his table. Let us confess our sins confident in God's forgiveness. We're on page 191. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Our offertory hymn is 506, Lord of all hopes, hopefulness. <laughs> Who's proud? 
thanks to our Lord God. Whose many graves we have gathered, 
and made into this one bread. So may the church gather from the midst of the earth into your kingdom. The gifts of God to the people of God. Thanks to God.
Ruler of the universe, all of creation yearns for his fullness in your Son. May we who have shared in the holy things grow into maturity in him. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We'll say the post-communion prayer found in your bulletin together. Heavenly Father, thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. The hymn to you to the Holy Spirit, we call honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is 577, God of Grace and God of Glory.
Lord. Thanks be to God.